So once again, a very warm welcome. We are going to get into the session very quickly. And just give me a minute and let me pull up the presentation. I'm getting some warning from my system, so just give me a moment to set that up and then I'll be just back with you in a moment. Just give me a minute, it's showing some audio issue, so let me just close some things. Okay, I think we should be okay by now. Okay, friend, um, can you just confirm that you can see the slide by putting it in the chat box or something? raise your hand and okay thank you i'm also audible right please put it in the chat box okay friends so thank you so much uh, so uh, as i already informed you earlier 2022 association of nurse executives india is going to focus on deciphering the who patient safety curriculum and we are committed to zero harm to our patients. So now, uh, as I told you, the first topic that we are going to discuss that is what is patient And all chapters are going to be, you know, simplified for nurses and nursing students. And uh, so uh, we have a year-end quiz based on all the 11 topics in India. December 2022 and prizes to win. Chennai. So Chennai. I hope you are here. Give me a moment, please. Okay. Uh, so, um, so I hope that all of you will come back for every month last Saturday to listen to the WHO patient safety curriculum guide being, you know, simplified for each one of you. you don't have to read 220 plus pages. Come here, at least you will get the essence of that book. And we hope to see you here every month. Thank you so much. Uh, this is being just one second. I'm sorry for that little interruption. Uh, this is being conducted by uh, any patient safety fellows. Uh, we are doing this in partnership with Patient Safety Movement Foundation from USA. So the first group has got eight people, and uh, those are the names in front of you. And these are the any members who are going to take you through the chapters. This month and next month, you will be seeing me following that the rest of the people come. And the calendar has already been shared with all of you. And next cohort of a year long patient safety fellowship will start in June 2022. More information will be given in due course of time. So before we start the patient safety, I would like you to watch this little video to set the context. So I hope uh, it will be audible and visible to all of you. It only takes a second to say Gabby Galbo's name and only a moment to tell you how needlessly she died. But if we were to call out all 250,000 people who die each year from preventable errors in healthcare, it would take us more than two weeks just to say their names and months to list all the loved ones and caregivers who feel the loss every hour of every day. Join us. It only takes. So, 
So that's why Annie has partnered with Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Uh, we have a lot of data coming out of other countries, especially US. But when we look for Indian data, it is very difficult to find the quantum of, you know, patient safety incidents that could have happened in our healthcare system. So what are we going to discuss today? We are going to understand why patient safety as a concern. Why is it that we are so much worried about it? And what are the concerns in developing country like ours? And how do failures happen? And is harm preventable? This is what is the discussion that is going to be today. So patient safety as a concern. So I'm just bringing in some, you know, video links here, which talks about preventable medical errors kill three-year-old Nora Bostrom. So she's three-year-old girl with the center line and she dies because of clapsy. And we all know that clapsy is preventable. The next one, misplaced feeding tube kills 11-day-old baby. And both these videos I'll be playing through the session and uh, which will which will actually tell us, you know, what is the impact on everyone, you know. So I think idea is to prevent all these avoidable harms or preventable harms you know we should do everything possible to ensure that we are doing all the right things so our patients are not harmed nobody comes to hospital saying that i'm going to harm a patient today but mistakes do happen now to prevent mistakes there is so many things that we need to uh, address and that's what we are going to learn in the next 11 months today i'm just starting the topic what is patient safety so it takes small careful steps to prevent patient harm so all the content that we are going to discuss will is taken only from this particular guide not from anywhere else so it is not a regular presentation where we take you know uh, inputs from different sites and put it all together no the, all the content that we are going to discuss will only come from the book except for the few videos that we will be playing for you to understand the domain a little bit more better. So I have another video for you, so let's watch that. I don't believe in hope anymore, and I never use the word hope anymore, ever. Like, I won't even just, you know, oh, I hope you feel better, or, like, I hope it goes well. Like, what's the point of that? What is the point of that? You know, I just sort of accept things as they come, and I don't pray anymore, because I prayed every day, every day. And I had so many friends and family, you know, across the world praying for Nora, and it made no difference. Two months after she came home from the NICU, she turned blue doctor comes in and says, um, you know, the things are going to be very different from now on because Nora has pulmonary hypertension. They were optimistic that Nora might not follow the normal course of the disease, that she might, instead of it progressing and getting worse, they told us that she would get better because her pulmonary hypertension was caused by being a preemie. And for two and a half years, the disease didn't progress and she did grow. She grew, she ate well, she developed, she was super smart. Very strong, she was running around like crazy. I mean, she was still in oxygen, but she was moving her all over the house, she was in the backyard, playing with a baseball bat and stuff. So that was really fun. First couple times she fainted, I didn't know how serious it was, I didn't know. And the doctors were kind of taking a wait and see attitude, I think. And then as she continued to faint, then they started to explain how serious it was. In October of 2012, she had a central line placed, and that central line delivered a continuous infusion of this pulmonary hypertension medication. So basically what happened is she developed um, an allergy to something with the dressing change. We don't know what. And so the home health nurse told us to change the dressing change protocol. And sure enough, not too long after we switched protocols, she got a central line infection. Like, I'm talking about how, you know, she could run like any other kid. Well, even after that first infection, she couldn't. They switched her back to the central line, but they followed the same, like, lesser dressing change protocol. 
clearly didn't work. She just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I could hear her little voice in the mask and she said, she said, please help me feel better. And I cradled her in my lap. Like I would when she was a baby, but she was such a big girl now, you know? She was really tall and, and her long legs and, and I just held her. And she just slipped away. The thing is that it's such a such an important job to, to work in healthcare and provide care. Compared to any other business, you you almost have to expect a sort of higher standard than almost in any other field. How do you make sure that the staff is implementing what we know works? And I think that there has to be a culture at every hospital that says, we're not going to accept central line infections. We're not going to accept them. So, friends, I'm sure that most of you who watched the video must have had a lump in your throat. This is not what we want to do with healthcare. We want to prevent. So I think the mother of Nora, towards the end of the video, she did say that how do healthcare ensure that uh, you know the protocols that are supposed to be followed are being implemented? And I'm sure that many senior nurses sitting in the audience would know how difficult it is to get the protocols to be implemented the way that it is being written. My dear friends, my dear fellow nurses, please understand the SOPs are written to protect you also so that you don't make a mistake and harm a patient by mistake. So it really does not make sense to take any shortcuts and later we come up with an excuse when it is too late. God forbid that none of us, when we finish our nursing career, should be carrying any burden. And I'm very sure the nurses who looked after Nora, they also are carrying the baggage, just like the parents of Nora. So let's try to understand that why patient safety is so relevant in healthcare. Because it can result in harm, leading to permanent injury or death. And we know that these are called sentinel events. And it mostly occurs because of the complexity of healthcare. I do understand the healthcare can be a very complex system, and we are a larger component of that particular system. So it st starts with an individual and goes all the way up to the leadership. So, apart from competence, I mean, you can have highly competent. You know, healthcare workers, but there are many other factors that are involved in preventing harm, and that is what we are going to decipher. It is good to understand what are all the factors that are involved. So please come back every month and learn more around patient safety. This is the data from US, which says medical error, not not medication error, medical error is the third highest cause of death or a killer. This is in 2013. You can look at any data that comes from the developed countries to say, where does the patient harm stand? And they will be definitely in the top three to five. That that's one of the reason for patients dying in, uh, in people dying in that particular country. So definitely patient safety is a universal concern. So let's try to understand that. This is uh, from JCI. You know, they have voluntary reporting of Sentinel events. And you can see that this is just an organization which is putting out the graph here from 2005 to 2020. 
So you can see the numbers, you know, maybe the beginning, the reporting might have been a little less. Otherwise, when you look at here, there is a peak over here in 2011. Otherwise, most of the numbers are around similar. I mean, similar number of organization reporting could be. But what it says is that the harm that we are doing to our patients is not literally coming down so much because the healthcare is getting more and more complex. We understand that. Now, when it comes to Sentinel event, it is good to understand the Sentinel event iceberg. All of us know about iceberg. We only see the top part of the iceberg. The majority of the iceberg is submerged within the ocean, but it is very dangerous. So if you look at this iceberg, you will see that serious events and death and severe harm is by and large known to everyone. The near miss, unwanted consequences prevented because of recovery that you actually found it, you caught it, and then, you know, it is called as near miss. The last one is no harm events, but potentially harmful, but it did not, you know, lead to harm. But the near miss, the no harm events are probably the most potential opportunities for us to learn from so that we can prevent the serious events. And the, this two are the ones which are not being reported completely because unless and until we report, we will not know what is actually ailing our system. And if we don't know, we are not going to do anything about it. So it's very important to know how much is our problem and where is our problem. For that, reporting is very important. Now, there will be more discussions in the future sessions also about reporting per se. You know, why people are not reporting, that also will be a discussion for sure. So wh why is patient safety a concern in Indian hospitals? So my friends, tell me that if this is the quantum of harm that is happening in the developed countries, what could be the quantum of ha harm happening in Indian hospitals? If you search for it, you don't get much. But yes, there is a data on lightning killed 72 in MP and there is a complete data of different states, what is happening. Unfortunately, if you look for any such information on patient harm, you really don't find. That is really sad. Because the world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything. This was told by Albert Einstein. And I think that is what is ailing our system because we do not know the numbers of patient harm in India. So what we don't know, we are very happy that it's not happening in our system because we don't know. Now, the question is also that why we don't know? Why? We do not know. How do failures happen? It is good to know. The most common reason cited in the document, failure to identify patient. Now, all of us know the protocol for identifying the patient. Now, check yourself that how many times we kind of take it for granted. I know this patient. ID band is not there. Oh, it's okay. I know the patient. ID band does not have clear legible data. Oh, that's also fine. I can give medication. I know the patient. Do we ask the patient to state his name? Do we identify the data which is available in the medical record with that of the ID band and with the patient? So there is a lot that a nurse needs to think whenever she or he is doing one procedure. So failure to identify patient is cited as one of the reason. Failure to prescribe right antibiotics. Now, my friends, please do remember when we are talking about patient safety, we are not saying that nurses are the 100% stakeholders of ensuring patient safety. We play a major role, but many other people, all the uh, people who are working in hospitals, they do have a stake in ensuring the patient safety. So this is cited as one of the reasons because this leads to antibiotic resistance and then we have resistant microorganisms so we have patients who get into sepsis and we are not able to recover them failure to communicate a major major lacunae in the system and failure to communicate or communication related issues are cited as the top three reasons for so many years for the uh, sentinel events across the world 
it used to be the top one and now it is uh, you always in the top three misuse of technology now more and more technology is you know coming into play and we all are getting comfortable using the technology even that can lead to patient harm so let's see i have got a you know data which has come from esri.org this is an organization based out of us and you know every year they kind of release uh, you know data around sentinel events now as i told you you can see on this graph that communication is again the third highest reason for patient harm the first one is human factors so next month we are going to discuss what are the human factors very interesting to see leadership now the the angle by which we look at patient harm has changed we are not looking at individuals we are looking at systems we are looking at processes that's how the human factors and leadership has gone up because it has to be led by top people it has to be a top-down approach everyone needs to be committed to patient safety so there are many aspects the leaders have to you know pay attention to and you can see further down you are seeing assessment information management environment, operative care, continuum of care, care planning, medication uses. This is how they have segregated the sentinel events. And it's very interesting to know that top three are human factors, leadership, and assessment. Reasons in developing countries as cited in the document. Let's see what does WHO patient safety curriculum discusses about. So this talks about that on the right hand side, you can see these are all the things that they are talking about in developing countries. The top patient safety events are related to healthcare associated infection, injuries due to surgical and anesthesia errors, injuries due to medical devices, unsafe injection practices, and blood products, unsafe practices for pregnant women, unsafe practices for newborn. So, this is what WHO talks about, and they also talk about the reasons, and this is a common reason for everyone, lack of individual commitment. Most of our hospitals are NABH or JCA accredited, but we still struggle with people following the set protocol. Why is it? Because we are lacking the individual commitment, means that I am committed to patient safety. Am I coming up with excuses to say it happened because of that, because of this? When there is a situation where you assess and find this is going to harm my patient, please speak up. This is very important at an individual level to identify and say that, you know, I'm sorry that this situation can lead to patient harm. Have the confidence to do so. Engaging patients and families respectfully. This is what the document is talking about, that because we are not engaging patients and families respectfully, we don't get their partnership in making sure that they get well soon without any harm and they go home. Then checking on procedures, before procedures, are you checking the right process? You know, is the patient identified properly? Is the process is laid out? Have you followed it? Now, very famous protocol all of you know is safe surgery checklist now we need to check are we implementing the same in honest honesty now this is one of my most favorite one learning from errors i can tell you from my 40 almost 40 years of experience we are very weak in this we do have errors we do rca and we do write down some corrective preventive actions, but they don't sustain. The mistake happens again. It may be because we have not put enough effort to learn from those errors. And also it is very important that we should be smart to learn from others' errors. If there is something that is happening in any hospital in the country, when we learn about it, do we go back and check our systems and processes to see if it can happen there? It can happen in my hospital also. Do we have that kind of an attitude? Now, my friends, Association of Nurse Executives India is embarking on a very ambitious journey of collecting such case studies where clinical reasoning can be learned through case studies. So we will be discussing 
the case study followed by what is what went right and what went wrong and it's a very powerful way of learning about patient safety is actually seeing real harm that happened or real potential harm it could be near miss or it could be uh, uh, you know events that could have led to harm so any members are collecting those case studies and we will if god with god's grace we should be able to publish that book and it could be of great help for all nurses and all nursing students because they are going to be real events with, but anonymously you know printed patient name everything will be changed and please wish any best of luck so that we can complete this you know initiative on time for the benefit of nurses and the nursing fraternity because association of nurse executive india stands for empowering nurses and nursing in india so we need to learn from our errors and we are going to facilitate that communicating effectively now this is very important that we should first of all learn that how we can communicate the starting point for communication is language very important language i got a call from one of the state the other day asking about some particular training and the person was talking in a native language so i asked the person that you know uh, what have you done you have done gnm bsc so she said she told me i have completed bsc and i said then why are you having difficulty in speaking in english she had no answer so i told her the entire training is going to be in english so if you don't understand english there is going to be a little bit of problem so uh, we know that uh, you know the state language is very important but if you are going to progress most of the orders are given in english and in many hospitals the language that is used is also english in all the premier hospitals you would see that the main language used is english so i think we need to first of all emphasize emphasis on learning that language very important because the written orders are written in english so english is being used very pr prominently in any hospitals across the country so we have to learn the language first then understand that what are those communication tools that you know that can be used effectively so that there is so much of theory and there is so much of importance given to communication how do we know that how do i communicate effectively without getting lost knowing english is good but then after that you have to communicate effectively and that is something that all you know students and nurses hospitals and nursing train um, learning you know institutions the learning centers must must focus on ensuring that all nurses are aware of those you know communication tools these are all evidence based communication tools available and we should we should get trained in that this is very important so now the question is is patient harm preventable so can i see some answers in the chat box is patient harm preventable yes can i see some answers in the chat box chat box mm -hmm. I'm, I'm watching, you can print, okay, yeah. Paula saying yes, 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 yes. So we all understand that patient harm is preventable, but they just don't get prevented because there are many things that need to be facilitated. So we are going to understand just an overview. We will be deep diving into many of those things in the subsequent topics. The most important component of, uh, you know, the uh, patient harm not getting prevented is that because we blame, we blame people. When something goes wrong, the first thing is who did it? We call the who and ask, why did you do this? We do not ask what happened. So maybe we should start, we should stop saying who, why first, and first find out what happened so what does the curriculum talks about the assumption is that it is based on a belief that the offender the person who made the mistake 
somehow chose to make the error rather than adopt the correct procedure. Many times we blame the person who made the mistake. You did wrong. You knew what is to be done. That the person intended to do the wrong thing. But that is very far from reality. Why do we think like that? Because individuals are trained or have professional organizational status. We think they should have known better. This is an assumption and which is not the right assumption. Our notion of personal responsibility play a role in search for the guilty party. Because all nurses and doctors are trained to take, to take responsibility for their patients, accountability for their patients. So when we become leaders, when we, when we are running departments, when we are running hospitals, we somehow believe that it has to be the professional who should be taking the responsibility because they have been trained to take care of that. But there are many other factors that can get involved and it is far more easier to fix one person. So when there is a problem, get anybody arrested. I am very sure that you must have seen in a lot of movies, you know, that when something goes wrong with the big honchos, they find some some person to put the blame. They even give money and say, you go to the jail and take up all the, you know, blame. So those kind of culture, I'm not saying that we send anybody to jail, but it's easier to attribute legal responsibility for an accident to the mistake or misconduct of those in control of the treatment rather than those who are at the managerial level. So WHO patient safety curriculum is talking about the entire system, not just the individual, not just the, the, the first level manager, all the way up to the top. To have a culture of no shame, no blame and no need. Can we adopt that culture? Try to find out what exactly went wrong. So in front of you, you are seeing a Swiss cheese model. I'm sure you will be seeing this in the future sessions as well, where, you know, what it shows is that we have SOPs, people have been trained, people know what they need to do, but somehow still the errors happen because at various steps, something was overlooked. So unless and until the different holes of the Swiss cheese gets aligned, the harm cannot reach the patient. So that is where we talk about nurses being the last line of defense. So we are right at the bedside. And if that bedside nurse knows that this is not right, please raise hands, speak up and say, no, this is harmful to my patient. But for that, there is a lot of things that bedside nurse needs to know. She should have the knowledge about the patient, knowledge about the patient condition, knowledge about the medications, knowledge about the side effects of the medications, and what is the prognosis of the patient, what is the treatment plan of the patient, what is the patient expected to behave in that particular day, what is going to happen. And if something hap something is initiated for the patient or not initiated, it can harm the patient. So she is like a superheroine. He is like a superhero by the bedside with that shield to protect the patient. I know it is a very major responsibility. I would say, please wear it with pride. And for that, there is this new term called good catch and best catch. That means nurses who actually catch right before the harm could have been done. Maybe the doctor by mistake wrote an order. But the nurse says, you know, sir, this is not the right order. You need to write it. The dose seems to be pretty high. That's a good catch. The nurse realizes that my patient is a potential for developing a particular, you know, hospital acquired condition. So she is discussing with the doctor. I think this is patient is at risk of, you know, developing this. Can we do something different for the care of this patient? So she's highly knowledgeable about her own patient so she can step in or the medication reconciliation you know the medication safety is a major component of patient safety do i know my patient's medications very well do i understand what is the action of the medication is there any drug drug interaction is there any drug diet interaction can i educate my patient can i discuss with the doctor 
there is so much the uh, assigned nurse is you know thinking in her or on mind there's so much to think about her assigned patients very active brain now on the lighter side i would say all nurses who really practice very active nursing they are going to stay young for a very long time because no alzheimer's no dementia because our brains are super active so remember that also because that's what's in it for me to be a great nurse right okay so we are going to look for no shame no blame and no name culture in our organizations now is harm preventable so we are going to understand that they are preventable but we need to understand errors have multiple causes and those causes the broad causes because we are not talking about the entire patient safety today i am just setting the context to the discussion of the entire curriculum in the subsequent months the multiple causes can be personal it can be situational because the situation led to harm personal could be that i knew what i have to do i was aware of what i have to do or i was personally maybe i have all my people you know suffering from covid or my somebody is admitted in my in the hospital i am thinking of giving the bill of that patient so these things can influence someone's decision making when they are on duty it's very easy to say park everything personal that side but most important is to understand that when we have something going on in our personal life it can impact our professional life that awareness will help us to stay alert to ensure that we are not getting into making any mistakes but yes the management or the organization is supposed to understand was there any personal involved in that situational situational because you are in such a situation maybe you are not trained to look after a particular type of patient a complex patient you know maybe because of that you ended up making an error so that is a example of a you know situational error but there is always a connection to the management or the leadership task related i am not comfortable doing a particular procedure but i did the procedure when i was asked to do the procedure i did not have the courage to say that i do not know to do this procedure so i need help so let me give you a real life incident so it happened many years ago in a ward where a patient was having icd so as usual in the morning more after morning care the nurses will change the dressing of the icd and they will also change the icd bag so the nurse goes and changes the icd bag so this is happening around say 7:30 am or something the doctors come the doctors come for round around uh, let's say around 9:30 10 or something oh immediately the nursing head is called why they say your nurses could have killed the, my patient what happened patient went into tachycardia he was little bit saturating but thankfully the consultant reached at the right time and he did a very simple thing he just removed the spigot of the uh, the icd bag what happened was that the nurse forgot to remove the air vent so obviously the icd was put for pneumothorax the bag had gone full and there was no place for the air to escape so it was accumulating in the patient's chest and that led to tachycardia and desaturation so this was an event that led to us admitting that this is a competency that we need to check and it's a critical competency every nurse should have how to look after a icd uh, you know drainage so this is how you know we could take and obviously that was related to the task the person was doing a task so we had to tell them what are the potential harm not that the person did not know it was a mistake so we had to there is always you know uh, if you know that if you fly in an aircraft if you fly in an aircraft your chances of that plane crashing is one in a million but if you get admitted to a hospital your chances of getting a hospital acquired infection is one in 25 ladies and gentlemen see the difference 
So this is even more important to know that our environment, the healthcare environment is so complex. So even flying an aeroplane is very complex, but they are so, so adherent to the protocol. And the other thing, one that aviation industry or the nuclear industry, if you look at, you know, what they see is the, if there is one error, let's say there is a, there is an example. They see that one of the jumbo jets, when it crashed, when they did the root cause analysis, they found that there was something called a condon belt or something. So they found there was something wrong with that particular belt. That was their finding, the engineers. So what happened? Within a very short period of time, all the jumbo jets across the world were checked for that particular belt. That is how the aviation industry works. That's why we so confidently board a flight, knowing that we will land safely. Now, when you look at this healthcare industry, which is not flying up in the air, it's actually on the earth. And there are so many people involved. The airplane is managed by two pilots and they carry 300, 400, 700 lives at one time. A similar situation is happening in hospital, but there it is not two. There are hundreds and hundreds of people involved in caring for these sick patients. So how much more diligence, how much more focus one need to pay to ensure that our patients are safe? What would be the role of the leadership? What would be the uh, role of all those you know, mid-level managers? It cannot be emphasized anymore because we must understand the aspects, the science of patient safety and the human factors so that we know that every decision that a nurse manager or a nursing director or a CEO or FD that takes, it will have an impact on the patient. We are now talking about first safety. So organizational level, has the organization got the focus on patient safety? If it is not, are the employees allowed to speak up if there are safety concerns? These are questions that need to be asked. Now we in India, we do not talk enough about our own mistakes. Nothing comes out in the media. There is no discussion around that. There is no uh, big body where, you know, patients who have suffered harm or their families, they come together to discuss about it. I was trying to look for any video that I can show you, which is from India. I just could not find because we don't have any organized effort to see that we are doing the best to ensure that our patients are safe. Now, there are violations that happen there are different types of violation mentioned in this curriculum we would like to quickly go through that violations happen because of lack of role models we don't have enough role models who are standing up for patient safety because of the blame name and shame culture lack of individual accountability we are not saying that individual is not accountable they are accountable so if you go to nhs and if you go to some systems in us they do have a decision making tree. So when an event happens, there is an algorithm which decides whether the person was individually responsible or some the system was responsible or the process was responsible. So it is already laid down. So if there is something like that, it, everyone knows that this is how the safety culture is being managed in my organization. Routine violations, failure to ha do hand hygiene. Isn't it a problem in our hospitals? Incomplete handover. These are all mentioned in the curriculum. Not attending the call bells. These are all routine violations that we do, you know, and you each one of them will can result in harm to the patient. Failure to do hand hygiene, hospital acquired infection. Incomplete handover, oh, anything can happen. Even sentinel events can be rooted back to incomplete handover. Not attending calls. Patient could be in some emergency need and we have not attended the patient and we could lose the patient. Maybe we are missing the early warning score or we missed to call the code blue on time. So there are many events that can be related to. Now, there is another term called optimizing violations. So what does that mean? When the organizations do not give 
emphasis on supervision. This can lead to violations. And the organization is optimizing it to by cutting off the supervisory level. Now, it's very important. It's very easy to say we need more supervision, but we also need supervisors who are very much aware of what needs to be supervised. I am a great champion of always stating you are a supervisor. You cannot supervise something that you do not know. If you don't know the, everything about infection prevention, how can you supervise your nursing team that they are doing the right things to prevent infection in the patient? And if you don't know what is medication safety, all aspects of it, how will you supervise? You know, So this is very, very important to keep in mind. Justifying unnecessary treatments. So this is uh, not at the nursing level, maybe at the medical level, you know, where uh, um, you know, the treatments which are not necessary or unnecessary tests are being, you know, ordered and nobody is checking on them. So this is like optimizing violation. The organization is keeping one eye closed so that, you know, it can continue to happen. Greed and thrills from risk taking. So some, it can happen that the uh, organization or an individual medical person can, you know, bring in some treatment which they think, you know, I can just try it on the patient. So these are some of the things that can happen or nursing team might, you know, uh, take some thrill in doing something new without ensuring they have followed the proper protocol for a new evidence-based practice to be developed. You know, these are things that can happen. Now, necessary violations. This is another terminology there. A person who deliberately do, does something they know to be dangerous or harmful does not necessarily intend a bad outcome, but poor understanding of professional obligations and a weak infrastructure for managing unprofessional behavior. I have highlighted a weak infrastructure for managing unprofessional behavior. The question is, are we able to discuss about even the violations, the small violations to the, to the routine violations? Are we discussing about that? Are we emphasizing the importance of these routine violations leading to major harm in our patients? Or we are we are saying we don't have much time to discuss that. We will talk about sentinel events. The, all the time should be you know, spent in ensuring that the routine violations are taken care of so that they do not lead to sentinel events. That means permanent injury and you know death of a patient. So it can provide a fertile ground for aberrant behavior to flourish. So it is like at, at home in our family, if we don't correct our children at the right time, we are telling the children, it's okay, that behavior is fine. Without even verbalizing it, they kind of understand it's okay to be like that. Then slowly they become, it is okay to be like that. And then it becomes a major problem. Then the parents sit and cry that, how come our children have turned out to be like that, you know? So this, these are, you know, these all these principles not only apply to our professional life, it also applies to our personal life. So there are different types of violations mentioned in the curriculum. So what are the action items? I'm aware of the time also. So we are into the last slide and then I have one video to show. So please stay back and watch the video. So what are the action items that are possible to be undertaken? Educate students and nurses. That's where we start. And I hope Association of Nurse Executives of India has really championed the whole of 2021. The whole of 22, 2022 is being dedicated to educating nurses and students around patient safety. Have explicit guidelines. Develop relationship with patients. Involve patients. Partner make the patients and family the partner in the treatment because they will also protect you from making any mistake understand multiple factors involved in failures that you are going to learn in the subsequent sessions avoid blaming when an error occurs try to ask what happened then go through the root cause analysis in the structured manner by looking more at the process and the support rather than the individual Practice evidence-based care. Know what is evidence-based care available and practice that. Maintain continuity of care. Last, act ethically every day. So when we come every day for duty, 
let's say a silent prayer to say god help me not to make a mistake by mistake and also help all my team members you know based on so uh, when i was a bedside nurse i used to pray for myself when we became a team leader i used to pray for my team and all the way up to nursing director i used to pray pray for the entire you know nursing department that you know protect all nurses you know and also lastly i would say that you know keep all our patients safe you know these are all very important because none of us come to hospital to say that you know today i will definitely make one error we don't we don't do that okay so now let's see as a final thought let's look at this one more real life story where the ng tube was misplaced When I was 18 weeks pregnant, they discovered he actually had a heart defect. And so we knew when he was born, he would be going into heart surgery. It was a big sense of relief when they said, you know, he did great. The nurse went to put in a feeding tube and uh, put it in through his nose and um, she started to struggle. And his color seemed to be, he seemed paler and he started blowing bubbles. And when we brought it up to the nurse, she came in and looked at him and um, just said, well, he's just a fussy baby. You know, I did tell her that, you know, the nurse previously struggled and had to put it under x-ray. And I felt a little dismissed when she was telling me, well, I've done this for 20 years and it should be fine. Right before she starts to do this, we tell her, you know, hey, his lips are turning blue. She finishes what she's doing and getting the feed and then starts to look and he starts blowing lots of bubbles. And at this point, she hits the call light. And then she looked at me and she says, I need you to run out in the hall and ask for help. And so I ran out in the hall and I screamed, my son is turning blue, I need help. And I think there was probably over 20 people surrounding his bed, doing everything they could. You just see all these people and they're working on him and they're working on him and they're working on him and then that team moves and another team comes in and they, they're working on him and working on him and working on him. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be happening. Like we're supposed to be going home in two days. And then at nine o'clock or a little bit after, I hear the doctor call. She says, we're gonna call it. He's passed away. Right there, you just break down. You know, they just, this isn't supposed to happen. He was doing so well. They said he was going home in a couple days. What happened? So they sat us down in the room. Grant's still laying there in the crib. And they told us, from what we could tell, it looks like the feeding tube that your son had went through his trachea and went into his lungs. The feeding tube nicked like the back of his throat. And when the milk went in, it went into his lungs. Our baby drowned on his own milk. And immediately I thought, I asked all these questions. I don't understand how that could have happened. Through our study, we've discovered there are probably at least 25% of children that are at risk um, of a misplaced feeding tube. and something needs to be done about it. Deanna has, you know, taken that by the scruff of the neck and have turned it into amazing things. Something needs to be done. We need to have the statistics to support it. And if we don't have the statistics, at least to have a method to say, this is the best practice and everybody should use this method going forward. And you need to stop the auscultation and aspiration because that does lead to death. I lost my son because of that. I don't want anyone else to lose their child because of it. And there was one day they were making some more changes at the hospital and they called it Target Zero and it stands for zero harm. Of course, I'm looking at every single child and we're talking to the nurses and we get to one child who's on a feeding tube. So I started asking that nurse some very leading questions to the point where she finally turns to me and she says, well, about five years ago, we had an infant that had a feeding tube put in him wrong. And so that's why they do it different now. 
And I looked at her and I said, thank you. You have just told my story back to me and validated that my son's death was not in vain and that people have learned from it and do remember him. When you have other people telling your story the same way the story was told to them, then you know that you made an impact on somebody's life at that point. Maybe if that one nurse had stopped and didn't put that last feed, maybe there would have been enough time to resuscitate Grant and that he'd be with us today. I'll never know. But maybe if she had paused and listened to us, maybe he would have. Such videos always uh, brings out a lump in my throat. Uh, me being a mother, I always start thinking, I wish that nurse listened to the mother at least when she told that last time I had difficulty with the child insertion of NGT and they had to use X-ray to confirm or to introduce. Maybe they used, um, you know, scanning to ensure that it was in the right place. The nurse did not listen and her answer was, I've done it for 20 years. Now friends, let's send, spend a moment that do we sometimes tend to get caught in that I have been a nurse for so many years or we are not listening to our patients and their families enough. They know their patient, they are with their children. Now looking at this video, I would urge all those uh, you know who are looking after the neonates and the children, what is the protocol for verifying that the NGT is in the right place? And uh, maybe this is how we learn. This is somebody else. And uh, in that country, they went ahead and they became the champions for the safety of NGT in children. And uh, that led to you know safe procedures in that hospital. So these are you know a great um, way of ensuring that the the sentinel event that happened it does not go in waste. It's not only that particular hospital. There are many other hospitals who are learning from it. So when we sit through such sessions, what are we deciding as individual nurses? What are we deciding as departmental heads? What are we deciding as the faculty of you know nursing students you know what are we deciding as the hospital administrators what are we deciding as whatever is the role that we are playing what are we deciding what is our contribution to patient safety that's the question that you need to answer to yourself and so my friends i just wanted to inform that the march 13 to 19 2022 is the patient safety awareness week so you have an opportunity to create activities to raise awareness on patient safety in your organization. So go ahead and plan. And a shout out to all the Annie members that if you have any idea how Annie should be, you know, celebrating this awareness week, please do let us know. So we'll be there and we would love to hear from you. And thank you for your participation. And I'm going to stop sharing here and I will also stop streaming on the Facebook and I will also stop recording